Welcome everyone to Thomasville First United Methodist Church. My name is Floyd White. I'm the church administrator here and I'm glad that you are joining us for worship. Whether you are with us online on Facebook or YouTube or whether you're joining us by way of WTUF Radio, we are glad that you are here. Just want to highlight a few things for you before we begin our worship service today. Uh, first, want to tell you that later in the service we will have a time of of giving and the reason why I'm highlighting that now is because we want to tell you that uh, we have generated a, a, an option for you to contribute to a love offering for James and Diane Sapp. We uh, will not get to have any kind of banquet or, or going away for the Saps as they leave us uh, before we return to in-person gatherings uh, but we do want to give you an opportunity to minister to them and say thank you for their service for the past three years. Uh, and so you'll be able to do that and see that link as I give you more information uh, during the time of offering. I uh, also want to tell you uh, that within the next few days you will be receiving an email with a survey as we get ready to return back to in-person gatherings starting June 21st we need to get a better idea of how many people will be attending. And so uh, please keep an eye on your email inbox so that we can uh, get, those, uh, or get that information that we need from those surveys. If you are not on our email list, uh, you can call the church office at 226-0840 and get added to that list. Or you can also do that uh, on our website, tfumc.com. All right, uh, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you for today. And for each person uh, listening or watching today, we pray that your spirit would uh, rest upon them, that they would know you are near, uh, God, and that they would uh, be able to turn to you in worship. God, we pray that this service would glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's listen to the prelude.
pray with me. Almighty God, on this day you open the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of your Holy Spirit. Shed abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel, that it may reach to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Now let us say together the affirmation of our faith today found in the Apostles' Creed number 881 in your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Now we come to a time of prayer. Let's go to the Lord again. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship, even if we're having to do it over the internet. I ask that you be with those professionals who are fighting this virus, as well as other viruses, the flu and other things that are going on right now, and dealing with other kind of sickness. We ask to be with the doctors, nurses, therapists, EMTs, all those who are part of the healing process. I ask, Lord, also that you'd be with those doctors that are doing research on vaccines and also testing the best way to test. And we ask that they might be able to ramp up the vaccines and the different kind of testings. And I ask, Lord, that you'd be with our law enforcement and fire personnel, our first responders, as they deal with the normal things of life, accidents, fires, all those things, but also this special need for this COVID-19 coronavirus. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with anyone who's afraid. 
that you might give them a peace through the power of your Holy Spirit and comfort them and remind them of how much you love them and care about them. That they might reach out to a friend and just talk. They might feel isolated. They reach out to a friend or someone and just to talk to someone. I ask, Lord, also you'd be with our political leaders here and around the world that they might make the right decisions that not only help in the short term, but the long term economies and lives getting back together. And we ask to be with them. And I ask to be with Christian leaders that they might make the right choices. That they would reach out to the people through the radio or through streaming or whatever to have worship services. And if they're in an area that can have in-person worship services, they start those back. And now, Lord, we pray as your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Confirm us in the truth that Christ makes known. We have faith and understanding through your helping gifts alone. Holy Spirit, come console us, come and advocate to Spirit from the Father, grant in Christ the help we need. Holy Spirit, come renew us, come yourself to make us live. Holy We come to a time now in our worship service where we want to give you the opportunity to uh, give in the form of an offering. This is a time in which uh, we celebrate God's generosity to us and we also try to respond with generosity as God calls us to be good stewards of all that He's given us. There are several ways you can give. You can, of course, uh, come by the church office at uh, 425 North Broad Street. Uh, you can also mail any uh, donation that you would like to make to P.O. Box 975. And you can also give online. You can go to our website, tfumc.com, click on the Give button in the top navigation bar. Uh, you can also give via text message. So if you will open the messaging app on your smartphone and send the message TFUMC Give, all one word, to the number 73256, you will be prompted in a way that you can give through text. Okay, do uh, want to remind you uh, that we do have an option for you to give online uh, at the website and through text messaging uh, for a love offering uh, to benefit James and Diane Sapp, whose uh, ministry here at First Methodist will be coming to an end here in the, in the middle of June. Uh, so you'll see those options there if you give online. All right, let's go to God now in prayer. God, we do celebrate your generosity and your provision. God, and we use this time of worship uh, to, to say thank you. 
uh, and to give back. We pray that you would use these gifts of our offerings and tithes for your kingdom. God, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now to uh, our sermon time, and uh, this is, you see the red display, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. Uh, if you were here and we were able to have in-person church, we would have a cake or cupcakes for you because we call this the birth of the church. That's our birthday of the church, the day of Pentecost, when God poured out His Holy Spirit on believers. Uh, our text is in Acts Gospel. I'll read that and then... We'll pray, and then I'll go on to the spoken word. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not these all speaking Galileans? And how is it that each hear them in our own language to which we were born? 
Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pompus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya and Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God and they all continue in amazement, great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. But Simon Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let us be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be that in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth to my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we've heard your written word read. I ask that you might speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit to illuminate into our hearts and our minds and our very soul what you want us to hear as individual Christians and as individual Christians who are part of a community of faith, the church, that we might be more like what you want us to be. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dynamic Christians serve God empowered by the Holy Spirit. Dynamic Christians serve God empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have this day of Pentecost. They're there for the feast. Jews from every country were told. And a loud sound like a rushing wind. It doesn't say it's a rushing wind. It says a sound like a rushing wind enters this house and it's so loud people in all over Jerusalem hear it. And inside there are tongues of fire that rest on each person there. Now when they say tongues of fire, they're talking about the part of a lamp they held that earthen lamp or metal lamp that held the wick was called the tongue. So that'd be where the light was. Not the whole lamp, but where the light was. Was on them. And the Holy Spirit was poured out on all of them in the house. And they began to speak. Crowds gathered because they heard this noise. What is this noise? And then they saw these Galileans speaking in their native language. And they were perplexed. How is it that a bunch of Galileans can speak our native language and we can understand them? They haven't been schooled. They're from Galilee. They don't know the, our languages. And it listed all the peoples that were there in their different languages. And some questioned, what does this mean? And others said, oh, they have sweet wine. In other words, they're drunk. The scoffers. There's always scoffers. But notice this group was told to wait until Jesus sent them the comforter. And they were assembled together and before they'd been afraid. And Jesus came to them. They were locked in their rooms before. And then Jesus came to them and now he's ascended to heaven and they said, wait, and they're together waiting. They're being obedient, and God pours out the Holy Spirit. That's why we call it the birth of the church. This day is when God poured out His Holy Spirit on believers. And these disciples began to serve the Lord. Now, I'm always intrigued because they're speaking a language they don't know from study. Some of you probably studied languages. French, Latin, German, Spanish. Spanish is maybe the most practical nowadays because there's so many people, Spanish peoples, speakers in our culture. But you've learned those languages and you studied them and some of you have an affinity for language and you learn them quicker than others. And young people, children learn languages better than us adults 
because there's something that seems to be when we're young in our brain that hadn't fully developed helps us pick up languages. And they're speaking and they're bewildered by this. How these are, And I've always been amazed that the Galileans, the disciples, didn't shut up and say, what am I saying? I've never spoken this language before, but they were testifying. They were serving the Lord. They didn't really understand yet. They didn't know what it was. And we're told here they were boldly testifying to God. And the Jews in the crowd that were gathered there for the festival, the feast, would have understood the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament background of God, about the prophets and Isaiah. But these people who waited for the Spirit have received it, and they start serving God. And if we're believers today, every believer has the Holy Spirit. That's why on the cross of the Methodist emblem, you probably can't see it here, but on our, my hymn, it's got in your hymn, if you were here, it's got the flame. Symbolic of God's outpouring of the Holy Spirit who leads us in what to say, who comforts us, who helps, and I pray about illuminating the scriptures to us, helping us to understand how to apply it to our daily lives today. We're empowered by that Holy Spirit and we're together with that Spirit I talked about last week, we're one through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that greater than anything that might possibly divide us, which our culture always tries to bombard us to divide us by age and education and, and gender and ethnicity. But none of that matters in comparison to the Holy Spirit. We also have the generational things, millennials and Xers and Boomers and the silent generation, the greatest generation, as Brokaw said, I always said he called it that to help him sell the book. But that's all marketing stuff. There are similarities in people who are reared in a certain time period, but it doesn't allow for geographical differences and cultural differences and Differences in how we family model what a family is supposed to be like and what we think adulthood is and how we teach our children. It was developed for marketing to help you buy something. None of those differences matter to Christians or should matter to Christians. Because the Holy Spirit, if you're a believer, you got the Holy Spirit, you might not listen to that Holy Spirit, you might not be guided by that Holy Spirit, but you got it if you're a believer. And it can illuminate God's truth to us just as it did the disciples. They understood Jesus' teachings once he breathed the Holy Spirit on them better in hindsight. And God sends his Spirit to empower the church, believers, to serve his purposes. Our example is Jesus Christ and he went to the cross to serve God's purposes that it might glorify him. And we as believers are to work to serve God to glorify him. But just as dynamic Christians serve God empowered by the Holy Spirit, dynamic Christians boldly witness to Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Dynamic Christians boldly witness to Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have a scene where they're, they're sharing the gospel, and Simon Peter stands up, and he says, these men are not drunk. This is what Joel the prophet, now the Jews would understand that, Joel the prophet was talking about. That's from Joel, by the way, chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. Let me reread that section 17 and 20 through 21 in Acts. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my bond slaves, both men and women. I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. 
and I'll show you that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. And Simon Peter says, that's what's happening. God is pouring out his spirit on those who believe in him, on men and women. And he says, men and women shall prophesy. One of the passages we go to in the New and Old Testament, since it's Joel chapter 2, that women are called to preach. To prophesy means to proclaim the word of God. A prophet of God tells forth the word of God far more then they predicted the future. If you look at the prophets, they only predicted the future if the people didn't repent. If they repented, God would have redeemed them. And to prophesy means to tell forth the word of God. Preachers, called preachers, tell forth the word of God. They remind us of the word of God, the written word of God. That's why I always try to tie my text to what I preach, where it's not opinion. It's God's Word. And he says, he will pour it out even on his bond slaves. By the way, if you're a Christian, you're a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You took that yoke on when you became a believer. Now, you might kick against it the whole time, but you took that yoke on when you became a believer. And Jesus says something incredible here. Young men shall see visions and old men will dream dreams. 90-year-olds don't typically dream dreams. 20 and 30-year-olds do, or 15-year-olds. And he's saying, God turns what we think of the lifespan upside down. If you're a believer, you can dream dreams even when you're 90, which is sort of hilarious in our culture because anybody over 50, our culture wants to throw away. Whereas in Jesus' day and the time before, they valued older people. Now we sort of think of them as disposable, which is not true. And he's saying, this is what the day of the Lord, before he comes the second time, he's poured out his spirit and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We, the church, are to boldly witness in whatever age we're alive in on this planet Earth. This church's building is a testament in 1885 and before people testified to Jesus. That's why this building was built in 1885. And it's been perpetuated by different generations. With God's purpose, hopefully, is that we boldly witness to Jesus Christ and how he can transform lives and he died on the cross for sinners. Aren't you glad? Because we're all sinners. I know to some, they might say, Preacher, I, 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 I can't testify. Well, these men... These disciples couldn't speak these languages they were speaking until they listened to the Holy Spirit. And then they boldly witness it. If you read the own following in Acts, Simon Peter lays it out. God's long-awaited Messiah, you people killed. That's pretty bold. Especially considering 43 days earlier, they're about a little more than that. They had crucified him. And so they're pretty stinking bold. And we're asked to witness in all kinds of ways. We teach children. We teach adults. It is harder to reach adults. I'll agree with that. That's why times I've had special times when I baptize adults. It's so neat. I baptized a 64-year-old guy because he accepted Christ when I was in Valdosta. Praise the Lord for the person that didn't give up to him and witness to him when they accepted Christ. He was 64 years old and we baptized him. Bold witnesses. Now, I'll agree that bold witnessing for Jesus Christ, some people think you're a fanatic. 
I don't understand why we're just holding out the hope of forgiveness of sins to mankind. As I told you before, I don't try to beat somebody in the head with the Bible and tell them how they're a sinner. Most people know they're sinners. They want relief. They want help. And the Holy Spirit convicts them. We don't convince anybody. We just share the truth and show them the love of God by the way we treat them. Are we perfect in that? No. As individuals, we're not perfect in that. And as a church, we're not perfect in that. I've been in the same church, and some people tell me how the congregation was so warm and accepting, and somebody else told me how they felt rejected. And I was thinking, it's the same people. Why did we treat these people markedly different? They weren't about the same age category. I didn't understand that. They were both couples. Didn't quite get it. I've been witnessing, well, church members have been witnessing this guy, and he wanted me to witness to his brother, and somebody insulted his wife two or three weeks in a row at Wednesday night meals, and they came and counseled with him and said, nothing to do with you, James. One, you're one of the reasons we're here, but we're changing churches because we're made not to feel welcome. And I'm encouraging my brother to go to the new church we're going to. Well, I broke my heart. Because we weren't modeling what the... And they weren't complainers. They had tried it for weeks and weeks and months and they joined the church, but they just wouldn't let them fit in. And it broke my heart because they'd both been workers. They had moved from another state for retirement. They had been in the leadership of the conference in those other states. And I just... I said, I'm... I'm sorry, can you give us a little more time? And they said, no, our patience is up. I said, okay. And I prayed with them, and they left. They went to another fine church. But I was thinking, we missed an opportunity. We're to boldly witness to Christ. We're not to beat people in the head with the Bible I don't believe or to tell them about the love of Christ and no matter what they've done, God can forgive them. Where they're a prisoner, who's out now? By the way, God tells us to visit prisoners in prison, in jail. Whether they're have a chemical dependency issues. I've always been amazed when I've been in churches that alcoholics were accepted, but drug addicts weren't. And I always wanted to go, don't you know alcohol is a drug? It's just a legal drug. Alcohol and other chemical dependencies is a cycle that's hard to break. I've worked with people in AA and NA, Narcotics Anonymous. It's a hard Vicious cycle. And some of the things are so much more deadly now. Crack and meth. and It leads to a life of destruction. And we, the church, are to minister them. No, I don't have all the answers. But we need to boldly witness for Jesus Christ in our community. That's what we're commissioned to do. God pours out His Holy Spirit to empower us to be bold witnesses and to comfort us when we're rejected, to comfort us when we're thrown in jail, to comfort us when people reject us. Jesus knew about rejection. He hadn't forgotten. The disciples know about rejection. They haven't forgotten and the Holy Spirit hasn't forgotten it either. We boldly witness for Jesus Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit, and that's why we're left here to minister in His name. For His glory, not ours. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here and to witness a worship service. 
I know most of the congregation's not here. They're listening by radio or they're on the internet. But we're united in purpose to worship you, Almighty God. I ask, Lord, that anybody who might feel your Holy Spirit working on them, that they might yield to your spirit and you touch them. And if they're not believers, they might turn to you and accept you as Savior and Lord of their life. And maybe people need to be praying for someone else or praying for themselves or maybe reaching out to someone else or just turning to you and saying, God, I need help. Help me. Lord God, as we give this time of invitation, may those who need to respond to you in the way that you would have them respond. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. In a moment, we're going to have that time where you can turn to God and say, God, I need your help. God, I'm a sinner. I want to turn from my sins and turn towards you. That's what it takes to become a believer. Or maybe you just need to pray for someone else or pray for yourself. Won't you take this time to respond to God as we sing? Tim will lead us. Tim?
Now that we've come to the close of our service, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask your blessings upon these people, that they, they might remember that you love them and care about them and want to bless them. And each morning as they get up, that you remind them how much you love them and care about them and want to bless them and bless someone through them. And even during this anxious time, they can look at your creation, the sky and the, the rain or the sun, and realize how much you love your creation. And as they go to bed, that you remind them how much you love them and care about them. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.